I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. Trailblazer, pioneer, these are only words, but that's what Janice Karpinski became when she went from being a teacher in a suburban classroom to a general, the first female general in the United States Army to command troops in a combat zone. And she's my guest today, and I am very delighted. I could also add the word to it as scapegoat, but I think that's beneath your dignity. I really do. You're too dignified and too um, honest, and the presence is so strong. Thank you so much, and I'm delighted to be here with you. Thank you. We have, uh, you have had quite a story. Uh, I think the first time I heard about you, unfortunately, was, you know, the evening news with you sitting in front of, were you in this, questioned by the Congress? I was never. Never questioned, questioned the Congress. By the Congress. Yeah. Uh, to this day, I've never... Uh, been called into the office of anybody in my chain of command. Right. They're all cowards <laughs> running for cover. But you were the commander I was. of all the prison facilities in Iraq. Correct. Right? When the first abuse became apparent in Abu Ghraib. And, That's correct. And, I had 17 prison facilities uh, under my command. Soldiers who said from the beginning, you, you're confronted with a situation where you they were deployed to uh, Iraq before I even arrived to take command of the brigade. They believed that they were getting ready to go home because their mission of prisoner of war operations were finished. They were complete uh, following the declaration of mission accomplished on the 1st of May. So now they're assigned this new, without any discussion, uh, any planning, any considerations, uh, the brigade is assigned a new mission for prison operations. and Extending their stay. Extending their stay. The soldiers felt as if they had been uh, taken hostage. It's got, there's so many pr things within things that it's hard to. Def You're a woman, first of all. Correct. But that may not have been effective. That didn't affect your relationship with your soldiers, I would imagine. They most likely loved you. They did, and I love them. <laughs> Good. And it was those soldiers that said to me, "You know, ma'am, you're the first general, female general, to command troops in a combat zone." Um, and they were delighted. Yeah. They wanted to have their picture taken together. They were just delighted to be part of that of, kind of, of a that thing. Event. But you were also in the reserves. Yes, I was. And and as you wrote in this wonderful book, which is, I think, it's like a mystery. I mean, I couldn't wait to get to the next chapter. Thank you. Uh, there is a difference between reserves and the regular army, and it shows up often, especially in war. I in guess. deployments. In mm -hmm. deployments. It, it, there shouldn't be. Yeah. Uh, especially not in deployments. But all of those differences surfaced and became abundantly clear in Iraq. Were all the MPs under your um, watch all uh, reserve officers? or They were reserve and National Guard. And National Guard. What's the difference? Uh, National Guard are units that belong to each state. So you'll have the New York National Guard, you'll have the New Jersey National Guard. Those soldiers can be federalized in order to deploy as they have been. Uh, For to floods be, or something. Well, they oh, don't have anything. to be federalized if it's oh. in their, their own state. But I the see. state adjutant general gives permission for them to federalize the troops, for them to deploy oh. in the event of national emergency. And how, what's their training? Well, they get basically the same training as all soldiers get. You're required to go to basic training, and then you have a specialty. And that training may be immediately after basic training, that's ideal, or it may be uh, the following year, depending on what your time availability is. Because soldiers in the reserve components in the National Guard have a civilian life uh, yeah. that's putting bread and butter on the table and their paychecks and their benefits. And their first loyalty uh, has to be to their civilian job. That's their full-time capacity. But I can tell you from serving half of my military career in the reserve components, that soldiers who serve in the reserve components or in the National Guard are put their first priority to their military responsibilities and duties, often at the sake of their civilian jobs. I was going to ask you about this, because you were in the real army. I don't, I don't mean yes. to say real army. What the do you regular call it? army. The regular mm -hmm. army. Um, but, and, but you grew up in the suburbs in New Jersey, right? Mm -hmm. Happy and a nice family and a great family that encouraged you to do all the different things you did. You became a school teacher. I did. You got married. I did. <laughs> Your husband was, uh, what was it? Was he a teacher too? He was. Yeah. And yet you were what, bored? I, I <laughs> thought that there excitement. was, I did. I wanted to see the world and I thought that there was more uh, out there. Yeah. And you always liked the Army. I did. Uh, for a long time, from the time that I was seven years old, I thought it was kind of an idea that made me so proud uh, yeah. and feel so good about 
uh, every time I saw a uniform, every time I heard the national anthem. So it was something that was not completely foreign to me, yeah. uh, the idea. And uh, when I said to my husband, I think I'm going to look into this. I think I'm going <laughs> to pursue this. He said, well, go ahead. He said, go right ahead. I think you should. And when the recruiter came to brought the paperwork and to uh, <laughs> give me a lot of things to consider, uh, he recruited my husband as well. <laughs> but you had tried once before to go into the ROTC or something, and they I said did. they wouldn't take women? Is well, that... the, when the man called me from the ROTC department on the phone, he said, oh, <laughs> I, I'm, he said, I'm looking at your name right now. I did not expect it to be a female on the other end of the phone. And he actually discouraged me. You know, you'll have to change your major, you'll probably have to take the time to build this into your schedule. You probably don't want to do this. You know, we don't have any other women in the program right now. And I was not necessarily discouraged, but he certainly changed my mind about pursuing it. Uh, so I picked it up again when I uh, got out of college yeah. and was teaching, and they had that information on file. When the recruiter came, he said, you actually applied for <laughs> or considered it one time before. And I told him that story and he laughed. He said, it doesn't surprise me, you know. But so there we go. That, so you went through all the basic training, became a lieutenant. I did. You became a paratrooper. I did. <laughs> <laughs> did you astonish everybody around you with your determination and courage? Uh, I think <laughs> um, maybe some people silently. Yeah. But at that time, it was after Vietnam, the draft was over, uh, they were, the military was trying to certainly fill its rank but keep pace with the civilian mm -hmm. opportunities that were tempting women uh, to, and men certainly, but more women coming into the workplace. So I, th but when they passed these laws uh, talking about full integration of women into a variety of specialties, they didn't sit the men down and say, look, Please. this is the way it's going to be. Or if they did, nobody ever told them, and if you don't do this, there's going to be trouble. So there may have been people saying, gee, we have a female that's doing this or this, or, um, and I was certainly not the only female doing this and this and this. Uh, unfortunately, during those years, there were women who were uh, taking the easy way. Uh, the cupcake jobs, if you mm. will, uh, being uh, the it's third clerical, assistant, isn't? the clerical, the uh, protocol officers, all of those are important jobs. But when doors are opened left and right for women to do things that they've never been allowed to do before in the military, uh, you should grab the gold ring when you have it. What do you so. think it is about the military that, you, that, that attracted you and that still does? I mean, it holds your heart. Uh, what is it? Well, you have a, a cross-section from the country. You have people that come from every walk of life, every kind of background. You want to see a tapestry of our nation. The military is a great place. It was a great place to see it at the time. And you, you don't stand out as being so extraordinary because mm -hmm. you want to do these things. I want to be in the field. I want to be around soldiers. I want to jump from airplanes. It was not <laughs> a language that people had never heard before. Um, and there were always people kind of uh, pushing the envelope, if you will. They, they did this um, demonstration where they do a uh, tactical extraction, it's called, and a helicopter comes in at low level, drops two lines, and then hooks you up and pulls you out, just hanging under the helicopter. And uh, one time a, a master sergeant said to me, hey, uh, l lieutenant, why don't you volunteer to do that? And I said, okay. <laughs> and then it and, goes in. <laughs> and I did. And when I finished, he said, now, were you scared out of your jump boots? And I said, no. I, I mean, <laughs> can we do it again? It <laughs> was fun. Um, so I was not, you know, I mean, I didn't feel like I was out of my element. Yeah. I actually felt like I was part of the it's element. Very. It's Then you were always a very, you must have always had administra administrative capabilities, organizing or or a natural instinct for organizing and relating to people? I, I, and I think I did. I grew yeah. up, I had five brothers and sisters. Um, grew up always around people. And my parents, my grandparents, were a very strong influence uh, as we were growing up. And I watched how every one of them treated people and had to do the same. Mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't be tolerated if you treated people differently or badly or... Uh, were rude or, or impolite. Yeah. Uh, and I found in the military, there certainly are people who have to learn those skills, but 
I treated soldiers as they treated me. And is there a difference because of the rank? Yes, but you earn the respect that they give you. And it's a very precious gift. Uh, and I learned more from soldiers serving in the military than I did from the books, the training, the courses, the officers, um, mentors, or uh, whatever they were calling themselves at the time. Do you think that you um, approach the whole thing with a, a woman's perspective? I, I think that yes, I, maybe not intentionally, uh -huh. um, because maybe I wouldn't have been able to define right. it at the time. But I do know that men approach things as looking for their individual credit, their individual glory. They want to hold on to mm -hmm. all of the details, and they only share parts with people that they feel very comfortable with or confident in. Uh, I, uh, you know, wanted a team effort. I would say, what do you think? And I would ask lieutenants, I would ask captains, I would ask sergeants, I would ask privates. And every one of them have a different perspective. Uh, That's I, interesting. I, so I wasn't afraid to share that, right. uh, the knowledge or the credit or the idea. And as a result, when I made a decision, they did not feel like they were never part of the decision-making process. And they maybe didn't agree 100%, but they always supported me. 110 percent. That, and that's, that's an incredible quality and, of course, a very political. I mean, it's, I've always felt women, have, there's a certain perspective to women that women bring to the public arena, especially when it's discussing uh, legislation, public affairs, administering government, or serving people. Uh, and that, I think, it, it's all the same. It's that you understand that you have to bring everybody along to make it a more comfortable thing. And, and the opposite is what got you into, well, I shouldn't say into trouble because you weren't, you didn't do anything wrong. They did it, but it made you the convenient target. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, because they conveniently, and they had, uh, you know, a lot of fans, they being the administration and the senior leaders in uh, Iraq at the time, they all viewed themselves and were viewed in Washington, D.C. as the powerful leaders of the mm -hmm. war in Iraq. Uh, nobody was asking them to have conversations with anybody. The idea that they had about these individuals was that they were strong, determined, could issue instructions, and you would make it happen. Uh, they didn't want a dialogue. They didn't want diplomacy. I don't think there was really any sincere interest in uh, creating a new road ahead for a democratic uh, Iraq. I, I, I mean, it was yeah. never evident ever, and it certainly isn't today. But the dialogue was the part that was missing. Well, who brings the dialogue to the table better than anybody else? Women. Right. Um, Absolutely. Can we talk about this? Because you have a compassion, you have an understanding. Now, of course, they would interpret that as a weak leader, uh, <laughs> as I was often described. Decisive. The, the, these soldiers got away with these things because I wasn't strong enough to intervene. Uh, well, first you have to imagine that soldiers are capable of doing the things that we saw in the photographs and in the reports in order to prepare yourself for that eventuality. I spoke to my soldiers as often as possible. 17 prison facilities spread as far north as you could go in Iraq, as far south as you could go in Iraq, and as far east. We had some facilities out to the west. And each one of these areas were under the control of a two-star general, a division commander. Uh, some of them would have a conversation with me, uh, a polite conversation with me, but most of them were following the line of the senior commander in Iraq at the time, uh, Lieutenant General Sanchez, who made no secret about disliking me, uh, not wanting a female general uh, in, on his turf, in his backyard, or certainly not one who was determined to show that she was as capable uh, yes. as any of the men that were there. In the book, and this was written in 2006, right? right. Um, but you talk about the original th uh, uh, problem of setting up a prison for people for the for the different. W what was it for? For Iraqi uh, questionable criminals. Criminals, right? These were Iraqi criminals. And you went to Abu Ghraib with with the, the what's his name from the UN? Uh, uh, Whatever you know, Demillo, Demillo, yes, and with Brenner, yes. And, and, every, and you said this is just a facility that can't really work. And the only reason, and I, I said to Mr. Jamilo, 
um, who was a, apparently a, a long time friend of uh, Ambassador Bremer. So that, that was necessary. He wanted to come out and have a different perspective. And uh, Mr. DeMillo served for more than 25 years in a variety of locations under the UN, and he saw similar mm -hmm. and far worse uh, situations. But he understood, and he understood what we were facing. He understood why we were using Abu Ghraib with a very small prisoner population at the time, because we had no other Good facilities nice to, to use to transfer them. Uh, and they were putting some financial resources into Abu Ghraib, but only the minimum, uh, because we never planned to stay at Abu Ghraib for and any length of time. And they kept adding to it, and, adding to And he, unfortunately, was killed. He was killed in the first yeah. uh, real insurgency right. attack. The other thing that we talked, you talked about was sharing information, and certainly they didn't share information with you at that facility because they brought in other interrogators. They took the, they, they took the prison away from you, yes, didn't they? they? Did. You yes. weren't even commanding the prison. No, I was not. So how did you land up in this situation? Well, they because they, again, you know, the devil is in the details, if you will. Abu Ghraib is one of our 17 prison facilities. We have a small and decreasing population of Iraqi criminals, nonviolent for the most part, caught looting, missing curfew, weapon in the trunk of their car, whatever it may have been, but nonviolent acts, and they were imprisoned. And as soon as other facilities in and around Baghdad primarily, but in other locations, as soon as they became uh, suitable, on a very minimal standard, we were able to transfer those prisoners mm -hmm. out. Then uh, they started to undertake these uh, very targeted operations in the division areas, and they were rounding up uh, a new category of prisoner, and they were not prisoners of war, they were not Iraqi criminals, they were categorized as security detainees. And when I asked the senior JAG officer, the senior lawyer to General Sanchez in Iraq, what, what is a security detainee? Why is that so important? And he said, oh, ma'am, if they're security detainees, they're either terrorists, they've participated in terrorist activities, or they can give us information about terrorists and or terrorist activities. Happened. And they were determined at that time to find a connection, of course, between Saddam mm -hmm. Hussein and Osama bin Laden. So that was in the course of General Miller's visit. General Miller was well, the commander. Well, now we have to talk about General Miller, because he's, they, he, following the, the administration and the lawyers deciding that it was all right to torture yeah, and stuff, and all the studies and everything else, commanded Gu Guantanamo, and then came, was sent to you to, to tell you what to do? Well, he was <laughs> sent to Iraq um, the first two weeks of September of 2003. This would have been about a week after these uh, activities to round up these security mm -hmm. detainees got underway. So a prisoner population that was less than a few hundred of Iraqi criminals at Abu Ghraib literally overnight doubled in size. And a month later, it was over 1,000 and nearing 1,500. Uh, many of them who had no idea why they'd been rounded up, or, and these were uh, the procedures that General Miller had uh, put in place, even though General Miller had no authority in Iraq at the time. He was not in a chain of command. He came with the uh, power and the influence of the former Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, and his uh, undersecretary, Stephen Cambone, and he came to teach the military interrogators the soldiers who were doing interrogations at the time, to teach them the harsher techniques in use at Guantanamo Bay and in Bagram Air Force Base in Afghanistan. He did not discuss any of that with me. He did not discuss any of the details. He did not share training information. He certainly never shared the memos uh, that have just recently been released. But clearly he knew he had the permissions, he had the policies, and he sat down with the commander of the Military Intelligence Brigade, who was living at Abu Ghraib at mm -hmm. the time, and explained all of it to them, uh, to the interrogators, to the commander and to his interrogators. And during his visit, during General Miller's visit, large numbers, first a few and then a few more and then a dozen at a time, contract interrogators. Uh, started to arrive outside. with uh, previous experience at Guantanamo Bay or at Bagram. Uh, they largely had the language skill uh, sent to Iraq to use those same interrogation practices, harsher techniques, and um, cut through this growing number 
of security detainees. Where is he now? General mm -hmm. Miller is retired. But in the book in 2006, you already talk about how you you questioned him and, and addressed him at a meeting when he first came and how he rebuffed you and wouldn't even talk to you. He, he kind of like yeah, uh, blew me blew off. off. He just Should he be tried? Should he be um, on trial? Well, I guess he fits under that same category as the CIA operatives or the contractors under contract to CIA who are working as interrogators who have uh, been excused because they were following what they believed were legal orders. To me, um, to me personally and professionally, the military knows and is extremely familiar with the Geneva Conventions. So what is the objective? If you are violating what you know is a long-standing adherence to the Geneva Conventions and to the fair treatment of prisoners under your control, what is the prize that you're reaching for? Why do you violate everything that you know? Because you uh, don't you don't object. You you go along. You go along. You just go along. Because you think there's a promotion, because you right. think that you're gonna be on the inside track, because what? Or if you object they'll look at you in a terrible way and they won't accept you or I mean, it's that way in everything, isn't better it? To but step not down, with the same consequence. Better to step down with your dignity right. than right. to go along with something that you know to be Absolutely. wrong and criminal and abusive. Absolutely. But you find the right people, apparently. You give them the right authority, and you read them the memorandums, and they say, no problem, sir. I will follow these orders. And he's not only, uh, and when he's not only using those policies at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, watching them perhaps or seeing the results from Bagram Air Force Base. Now he comes to Iraq to teach the same procedures. Right. And oh, by the way, if we don't have enough military interrogators, we're going to bring in this whole separate army of contract interrogators to carry out those And what did orders. they learn where Osama bin Laden was? They no. never did. <laughs> no, of course not. And in not. fact, in the two months uh, before the prison was actually transferred from a prison operation, a detention operation, it is now, uh, it has become an interrogation center for all of Iraq under General Miller's plan to do so, even though he's not in Iraq, but he's guiding them and directing them from his uh, command post at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Uh, when Saddam Hussein was captured in December of 2003. It was not to the credit of any information that they got, developed yeah. at Abu Ghraib. It was derived from information done the correct way. They went out into the local community surrounding the last known uh, sighting of him and talked to people who gave them pieces of information and confirmation of pieces of information that led them to the location. Incredible. It is. And so you were held responsible. Yes. And uh, you were, were demoted. I was. From a general to? Colonel. Colonel. And then you resigned? Or what did I, you do? I could not resign. I had to wait for all of the uh, 16 or 17 uh, investigations that were being conducted. I had to wait for them to be finished because I could be, um, so they, they have an action that they call a flag, and they put that flag on your record, and that means that you can't leave the military, you can't join the military. You can't do anything. You can't do anything. And when the last investigation was complete, I, uh, I resigned. And uh, to this day, I mean, it's such an important point that the, the, these heroes in my chain of command, so-called heroes, uh, and, I, and I say that very sarcastically because not one of them had the backbone uh, to call me into their office. There is a procedure. Uh, you, you're going to demote me, you're going to charge me, you're going to tell accuse me of things. Bring me into a courtroom. Tell me. Give me a court martial. Yeah. They did none of that. They operated outside of the Uniform Code of Military Justice and quite frankly, outside of the law. Yeah. But it didn't make any difference. Uh, they took every one of those actions without any conversation with me whatsoever. Uh, I found out that I was demoted by fax. Hmm. That is unbelievable. I hope you kept the fax. I have the fax. Right. <laughs> Do you still, but you still, you love the Army and the way you worked with other people. I, I, and what you I, do. I do, and I try to focus on yeah. all of the things 
before uh -huh. the accusations from Abu Ghraib, and the outpouring of support from soldiers that I served with when I was a lieutenant, when I was a captain, when I was a commander or a staff officer, people I went to schools with. There literally was an outpouring. Well, I hope you get um, your back to being a general, and I hope you get an extra star if that's what happens. <laughs> and I hope you'll come back because we haven't talked about anything else. I mean, you've been a diplomat. You've you've worked with women in Arab countries, and they're all, it's all so interesting. So I can't wait for another session with you. And I thank you very much because we've come to the end. Oh, well, that's, time flies. Huh? All right. Thank Thanks, you so general. much, Ron. Thank you. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.